Chris from the Mighty Decibel here. Welcome back. Uh, so this episode, we're going to be returning to our Albums by the Decade series. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the band Dio. And uh, I'm a little scant in my knowledge of the band. So I've invited an expert to join us to walk us through this. It's none other than the illustrious Martin Popoff, author of two Dio books and over 100 other metal and rock books. Welcome, Martin. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Looking forward to this. Let's do all it. All right. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about, first of all, the two books. So I've got your 2006 book here, The uh, Light Be Beyond the Black. Uh, but then you've just issued a brand spanking new one, Dream Evil Dio in yeah. the 80s. That would be that there one there. Is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> what possessed you to write uh, two books on, on Dio? Was it a case of a love for the band or you saw a dearth of information in the marketplace on it or, or both? Yeah. So so I did, a, what is it, three, four books for, uh, for Metal Blade Records back a long time ago. And Dio was one of them. And we weren't, you know, I mean, this is, I'm writing this way long time ago. So I'm, I'm not as good as I am now. I'm, I, I hope I got better. Uh, but also, you know, we didn't really have any pictures in it. So what I've done with a lot of these old books is uh, updated and greatly expanded them. And this was kind of next on the plate for being one of the super old books, one of the first books I ever wrote. So that book that you have there is, is every album right up to the end. Um, but the new one is more or less as long as the old one, but it's greatly expanded and it's only the albums from the 80s. So a lot of, you know, a lot of new interviews since that book over the years. I think that book is a 2005, 2007, Six. something like yeah. that. Six. OK, so it's it's pretty old. Um, so, uh, yeah, rewritten, greatly expanded, more analysis, more interviews, uh, way more pictures. Uh, and the new one's got, you know, two tipped in color sections of pictures. I've started doing that in, on all the books that I do myself as well. Um, so yeah, essentially, uh, I just wanted to do a deeper, deeper dive and, uh, and just look at this part and hopefully I'll do a second half. So what'll happen is just like many of my books that I've turned into two, like the Sabbath and the priest, right. it'll be double the size and, and better, uh, when, once it's all done. Right on. So the next one might be a nineties by itself. And then a third one on thousands, or you think you'll merge the nineties? No, I'd that? merge the two because there's only, I think, what is it? Three, three albums in each of those decades. So it'll be right up to the end. Uh, right on. If I do it, it's going to be called killing the dragon uh, deal in the nineties and two thousands. And, uh, you know, put it out there. Uh, if anybody's ever taken pictures of the band from 1990 to the end, I don't have any pictures. And that's why right now I'm not even really considering doing it. I, I've got to get some pictures first. Um, yeah. so yeah, if anybody's got photos, uh, taking shots of the band, uh, from 1990 moving and forward at all. I'm surprised somebody in the Dio fan club should have, uh, you know, yeah, I haven't really asked in a big way yet. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I will eventually. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, before we get into the meat of the subject, uh, can you uh, provide us with a, a quick bio overview of the band that leads us into the discussion? Yeah. Okay. So, so Holy Diver uh, comes out uh, 83, uh, essentially Ronnie and Vinny fall out with uh, Tony and Geezer in Sabbath. They do heaven and hell and mob rules. So they start this new band. Um, you know, Wendy had already more or less had a solo deal going for them and they pulled that out of their hat and said, okay, well, let's do it. Let's do this solo deal. They come, come out with two great albums, right, right out, out of the gate, the last in line does really well as well. And Dio is now a, you know, a headliner, a pretty, pretty well operating machine. Um, they move on sacred heart. They have a fallout with, uh, with their hotshot guitarist, uh, Vivian Campbell, um, mm -hmm. who came from the sweet savage band, um, kind of a new wave of British heavy metal band that didn't really put out much. Um, but yeah, he's, he's a great guitar hero. He's doing great stuff on these things. They have a falling out, but they do another good album in, in dream evil. The wheels kind of fall off of the bus, you know, the lineup starts shifting and, and they become somewhat of a, of a, well, quite a bit of a smaller band. So, so the golden era where they're doing quite well, I think it's uh, how does, how does it work? I think they've got a, a platinum and a gold um, and, and maybe another gold. Um, I didn't. Two I didn't platinums know. and yeah, it's the first Is two it, are platinums in the U S and then gold. Uh, and gold. The okay. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you for that. So um 
so that's their golden period, but then they're kind of down on, on minor labels and uh, Rowan Robertson is in and Tracy G is in, and then they have other lineup changes, but they only have, they only put out three albums. Uh, let's see one, hang on one, two, three. Yeah. Three in the nineties and three in the two thousands. And that's all they do because also along the way, um, you know, Dio goes back with, uh, with the Sabbath guys and they do dehumanizer in 92. And then later on, it's kind of all mixed up in, in reforming with Sabbath again and renaming the band heaven and hell. Um, so, you know, when, when the wheels fall off and, you know, dream evil is a, is a great album. It's, it's my favorite of the eighties, actually, it's a bit of a contrarian choice and we've done a contrarians episode on that. Um, but once that happens, once Vivian's gone and, and Craig comes in, um, their sales kind of go down, uh, but that album should have done well, but they kind of never recovering. He's, he's never really that big a band again. So it's always interwoven with this whole Sabbath thing. You know, you got Sabbath at the beginning, Sabbath of 92, Sabbath yeah. at the end before, unfortunately, you lose Ronnie to death from stomach cancer. Um, yeah. But um, but yeah. They and, just, and, and in the middle, there's the, the grunge era, too, right? So yep. that impacted all the bands, all the metal bands, right? Sure, yeah. It was one of the ones that got hit by this. Yep. And they're on small labels and, uh, you know, there's some live albums along the way and stuff. And the touring is is there, but it's, uh, again, it's it's mixed in. Essentially, his whole career is part Sabbath, part deal. Right on. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, so let's get into the meat of it. So what we do with the albums by the decade is we ask our uh, resident experts on the band to go through each decade and then name the best and the worst album of each decade. And then anything else that's, uh, you know, uh, interesting or uh, important during each of the eras and touch on the other albums if, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So we usually do this chrono uh, chronologically. So we'll start uh, in the 80s, which is inarguably, as you pointed out, the uh, golden era of the band. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you got four albums in quick succession here. There's uh, Holy Diver in 83. Last in Line in 84, Sacred Heart in 85, and then Dream Evil, Evil in 1987. So you've already named uh, Dream Evil uh, Contrarian for sure, <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for most people, um, as your favorite. Uh, what is it about Dream Evil that makes it your favorite? Yeah, so it, it would be my favorite just by a little bit. I mean, and second, actually, for me would be The Last in Line. On Most people go with Holy Diver and then yeah. The Last in Line. And then actually a lot, a lot of people, 50-50, will go Sacred Heart or Dream Evil. Mm -hmm. I've never understood this, this um, you know, ignoring of Dream Evil. When I play that record, I mean, I just feel like it's full of great songs. It's pretty up-tempo. Um, the production's great. Craig does a great job. I mean, Craig, I guess fits in the band is a little bit um, you know it, it sounds like there's a little tension there and he's working way too hard on his solos and all this sort of stuff but essentially the 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 outcome is is great um i think it's a like sunset superman is a song a lot of people kind of forget but i think it's probably his best song um but yeah so that album i think feels uh literally like the same product mix as those first two albums and then for worst of the decade i i definitely um strongly would go with sacred heart um i always found the productions kind of screech on it the, the keyboards aren't dovetailed in too well there's maybe a little bit too much of that it's a little bit too poppy i don't like the king of rock and roll at all it, it reminds me of my same dislike of long live rock and roll back on the third album deal yeah. with rainbow um so uh definitely for me and i think for most people you know if if they're if they're deep fans and have really looked at it i think dream evil would come in third for most of those people not at the bottom i think most people would put sacred heart at, at the bottom so uh so yeah i'll go dream evil first and sacred heart at the bottom the other two in the middle cool yeah for me personally um uh, the mid eighties, I switched from arena metal into the underground, you know, you know, thrash was big and, and, uh, hardcore punk and crossover and all that stuff. So I, I really last lost track with Dio mm -hmm. after the last in line. I, I do have sacred heart, but I just didn't, you know, I moved away from that. So that's, uh, it's great to have you here to help us yeah. through all this. The one <laughs> yeah, thing I was curious about is on these two albums here uh yeah you can see it here uh you got the mascot what did he call him murray murray yeah and then he goes to the dragon mascot dean mm -hmm. 
And then uh, on Dream Evil, he goes back to Murray and then drops him from there on end. Do you know what the history of that? Like, you know, like Iron Maiden was smart with Eddie to, re, you know, yeah. use him throughout all the time. Why did they drop this? Like, I thought that was a great mascot to have. Yeah, good question. I've never really thought about it. I, I have a feeling it's just the idea of uh, moving on and maybe thinking it's a little silly. It's probably better to move on, really. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the mascot situation isn't particularly there as, as we go forward. There's still dragons and stuff and monsters mm -hmm. and um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, honestly, I, I look at that and I don't think it's a very good mascot anyways. Um, you know, and I, I don't think it really took off. Um, so, you know, it, he, he lyrically gets better and moves on and does some other really cool things with lyrics. So I think it's just a case of Ronnie maturing. And what was, what was the cause of the friction with, uh, Vinnie Campbell that, uh, caused them to, uh, caused him to leave the fold, you know? Yeah. Vivian Campbell. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, pre it's pretty clear cut. And, and oddly enough, there's been a lot of interviews lately where Vivian's talking about this and, and explaining the whole thing. And it, it really, I think, comes down to this idea that they had this meeting where they said at, they all got together and Wendy, you know, importantly, wasn't there. Um, but they all got together this drunken restaurant meeting or something. I think they were in the UK or something. Never like a good that. idea. <laughs> yeah. And they basically, you know, came to the agreement that after the third album, everything would be made equitable if the band is doing OK. Kind right. of thing. And, uh, you know, so that means royalties and songwriting splits and all that kind of stuff. And I suppose the pay would be the structure would be changed rather than just, you know, direct pay you for whatever um and then and then you know it's it's viv's contention that 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 never happened and i think everybody would agree you know ronnie's not here to talk about it but i think wendy would even agree that that never happened but you know th then it comes down to a dynamic of is ronnie sort of forceful enough to tell wendy that this is that this was the was the situation is there is there a little bit of convenience here that wendy wasn't there and wendy is kind of the boss and wendy gets to decide and um so you know and and i've seen wendy's and, and in the book you know i've i've got both sides of the story you know wendy gets to say her piece i don't know if she argues it all that well and and really addresses the actual issue of how of how that happened in Wendy's defense, I would say that probably um, like Viv's probably I would say Viv's side of the story is 100 percent correct. But then Wendy, I think in her defense, if she wanted to kind of defend what went down more, I bet I bet uh, there's there's a lot of costs involved where where there really wasn't as much money floating around as as kind of these other guys might have thought there was sure. um i have a feeling you know when you mix that story with the same way of what went down in the gillen band i think you would find a little more similarities there um because sure. the other guys in the gillen band thought there was all this money and we should be doing better and we should be getting paid more and and in that situation even more so i i think you realize there really wasn't that much money floating around but yeah it just sounds like maybe wendy not being there and Ronnie not pushing the issue and you know it's it's a little bit of a grayscale but it, it just sounds like um this deal that they had did not come true right. um and that's more or less it yeah yeah when I was uh, reading a book actually I reread it just uh recently I, I certainly got that impression that that Campbell's side seemed to have more weight to it uh but then it's sort of like piecing together the other side of the equation. Like instead of just outright saying, um, you know, Dio and, and uh, the manager saying, Hey, we, we put all the profits into the uh, road show year after year. And we really weren't making that much because we were, we owed the money uh, to build the big uh, stage show and we weren't making any money. Uh, it, it didn't seem to uh, be clearly stated by Dio or anybody uh, on their side. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot from Wendy in the new book about that and, and you know, Viv's side of the story and Wendy's, but but I, I just, I kind of had one interview where it was uh, uh, sort of explained rather well. This was uh, from an interview with a buddy of mine, Jimmy K. And, um, and, and I don't know if she argues it all that well. I think she still, she still has to maybe, 
I, I think if she got out there and told her story in a little more detail and explained it a little better, yeah. we, we might see a yeah. little more both sides of the story. But like I say, Viv, Viv's out there been talking about a lot, even lately for some reason. So he's explained it a few times and, and, uh, and he's never really contradicted himself either. I think we, yeah. if, if, you know, if you were a huge deal uh, researcher and expert and wanted to listen to Viv telling this story about 10 times, you'd really kind of understand his side of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anything else from the 80s that you want to touch on before we move to the uh, 90s? No, not particularly. Um, you know, that is that those are the uh, there's four albums uh, for the 80s. And I, I think we've we've got those ranked pretty good. It gets even simpler when we move to the 90s. Right on. Yeah. So the 90s, as you said, there's three albums. Uh, there was 1990 Lock Up the Wolves and then 91, 92. They left for uh, uh, Dio left for uh, Black Sabbath uh, Dehumanizer. But then uh, they're back at it in 93 with Strange Highways and 96 was Angry Machines. So uh, which of those uh, three is your fave? Well, I would go with Angry Machines by a little bit over Strange Highways. Strange Highways is pretty slow and doomy and dark. I mean, people have said it's kind of the heaviest Dio album. We just did a Contrarians episode, Dark Horse episode, all, all about Strange Highways. It was really cool. We went for like an hour or something with a bunch of panel members talking about that album. But I've always liked Angry Machines a little bit more. It feels a little more uh, up-tempo and modern, um, not so just kind of trudgy. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of slow deal. Um, and then uh, lock up the wolves. Yeah. So I'd, I'd have angry machines first, then in the middle, strange highways. And I'd put lock up the wolves, definitely the lowest. Um, I find it to be the slowest and least exciting. I don't know if that's really the fault of Rowan Robertson. I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's Ronnie's predilection for really liking this kind of slow stuff. I'm not crazy about the production. It's kind of big and blocky. I think the production's really good on Strange Highways and then maybe down a notch again on, on Angry Machines. But yeah, I just I just feel the firepower and the excitement of Angry Machines is, is a little bit more there uh, in 96 than what you get on in 93. But 93 feels a little bit more like a major label album. It actually feels the most major label out of all of them. Uh, Vinny Apice's drumming on there is just absolutely amazing he's one of the best at playing slow you know it's something he talks about it's something bill ward talks about uh, but he does a really good job of playing slow on that album but uh but yeah i, I think uh they do a good job on the next one tracy g as a guitarist gets gets a lot of uh stick for maybe being kind of like a noisy out there experimental guitarist and not so classical uh like like uh viv um, so he, he wasn't that well accepted in the camp. Great guy, amazing guy. Uh, but I think, I think his two albums are a little underrated. So yeah, Angry Machines top, lock up the wolves bottom. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how they slowed down, uh, the material in, in the nineties and, uh, Dio's role in the writing. Uh, so I assume he did all the lyrics, but from a writing perspective, was he uh, co-writing the music or was he leaving the uh, other band, various band members, because there's a bunch of changes through the 90s, to write it? Like, uh, what's the music writing? How does that look? Who, who's involved? Yeah, he's pretty involved in the music writing. Uh, he'll he'll write it on a guitar. He'll sit there like Wendy says and like Ronnie used to say, you know, he would sit and watch sports and write songs. So he would do lyrics. And I, I'm pretty sure he, he would write music as well. But he liked he liked just the sort of, you know, you don't have to put your mind into a, a, a game and you, he'd sit there and watch sports and, and write stuff. But he was good enough on guitar uh, such that he would come up with riffs and uh, and he would be pretty pretty heavy in in the music end of things but yeah his generally his guitarists would write a fair bit jimmy bain the bass player who we also sadly lost recently to cancer um he uh he was kind of uh considered a a bit of a secret weapon in the band a little bit of a john paul jones he, he was known for you know writing some of the more commercial things and wanting to to write some more commercial things uh vinnie apice wouldn't be involved in the writing at all more or less um but he put his stamp on things so yeah he was he was in there he was in there in the music it's uh this is a band you know it's it's named after him with the short version just like a like a van halen i suppose but it but it's a band where he uh participated in all aspects of it producing as well yeah um, actually that's a good point i wanted to chat about uh is that in the 80s he produced all the albums and then with 90 he teamed up with tony platt to produce 
Then in 93, he stepped out of the producer role altogether and had Mike Fraser uh, 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 do the production. And then back in 1996, he returns as producer. So is that record label pressure to move him away from the producer's chair or, or what's going on there? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, and both of those guys, Mike Fraser and Tony Platt, are known almost more as engineers. So, so they have a strong, they're a strong engineer producer type guy. So Ronnie is certainly still, you know, he's probably producing those albums almost as much as, as if his name is on it as, as producer, because he's always had strong engineers. Um, so he's always collaborating. Um, you know, I don't think he's he's a particular credit hog ever uh, on songwriting, even as well. He's not he's not like in there voraciously saying, you know, everything has to be said. It was written written by me kind of thing. Um, and yeah, pr producing's a little bit like that as well. So he's got strong opinions. He knows what he wants. And uh, and frankly, he never really uh, thinking about I'm just kind of looking over the list. I mean, I would say. I would say, even though I'm not crazy about some of these albums, and usually it's just about the slowness, I wouldn't say he has a particular problems in production. Like I say, Sacred Heart is a little noisy, um, but um, yeah, all these 90s albums, they, they might be a little thick, blocky, but they still sound good. And even in the 2000s, I don't think he really has albums that don't sound good. And what about the band movement? You know, they had three keyboardists over three albums, uh, two drummers, two guitarists. Uh, you know, what, what's causing that change? And is that back to the mo uh, money thing again, that people saying I should be making more? Or is it just a case of, uh, you know, uh, musical differences? What, what, what was happening there? Yeah, it could be a little bit of that. Um, I think on the keyboardist end of things, um, you might have uh, because also also in this book, there's a there's a fair bit of Claude Schnell in there, and I think you get a with Claude, you get a little bit of the business side of it, but also the fact that a keyboardist is never going to be very happy in the Dio band because uh, he doesn't really want a lot of keyboards. He's not a keyboard sure. fan. It, it's almost like he's just finding a place to put them in, but he'd, he'd rather them just be out there in a live role and filling in on rhythm guitar, essentially mm -hmm. on keyboards. Um, so yeah, a, keyboard is, a keyboardist is never going to be creatively self-actualized in the Dio band. Um, you know, another really interesting thing, uh, a comment that I heard as, a, as an aside, more or less from Doug Aldrich in the band, that I thought was really interesting and, and probably uh, overruns or, or overrides a lot of these troop movements within the band, is the idea that um, it's a super, super professional band and Ronnie always wants everybody to practice a lot so there's a lot of routining of the material and he told me once um that i thought it was a little revealing is that we were always rehearsing we were always practicing and we were never really particularly getting paid for doing that side of it uh -huh. so so they were just always busy doing doing a lot of routining of, of everything getting it really tight for the live live show <laughs> you know an, an uncommon amount of rehearsals and uh, and it's like well, you know I he he said how did he phrase it this is a long time ago and it's it's in the well it's actually not in this book it'd be in the next book but um but he said uh, and it would be in the old book probably too but he said you know I was starting a family and I had a mortgage and all this stuff and I'm just going in and playing all day and you know we're not really getting paid for it so so it it was a bit like that it was a bit. <laughs> um, it's almost like for the size of the band too, too much demands was put on their time possibly. Um, but yeah, that would be an interesting thing to, uh, to really probe, you know, some of the other guys on and see if, if they felt the same way. That was like what um, I saw a documentary on Leonard Skinner and uh, all the band members were saying the same thing uh, that the lead singer uh, who passed away, I forget his name. Yeah. Uh, Zant, Von Zant, Zant. Zant. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, he was basically the one who was whipping them uh, into shape and they would go in for, you know, 10 hours a day practicing. And then, and, you know, there was yeah. a little bit of tension there between the bands, but he, yeah. he, you know, uh, drove them uh, uh, crazy with the practicing. Yeah. But uh, I guess what, what comes out in the end though, is a professional outfit, right? The more you practice, the better you are. Yeah. The records in the live shows were top flight. So they were always, you know, despite the record sales, not being great really ever again, they were always a top shelf band. Right on. Anything else from the nineties you wanted to touch on? Not particularly. There were only the, uh, the three albums, right? One, two, mm -hmm. three. Yep. So yeah, no, that's, that's good. 
Okay, so let's uh, get to the final era, the 2000s. So there's uh, Magicka in 2000, uh, Killing the Dragon in 02, and then the final Dio album in 04 was Master of the Moon before they either, uh, Dio returned to uh, Heaven and Hell. So uh, again, what is your top album of the, the decade? Yeah, so, uh, so for the top, I would go with Killing the Dragon. Uh, and then in the middle, I would go with Master of the Moon. And then the least uh, least uh, appreciated by me would be Magicka, 2000. Um, so, so again, the theme here, a couple of themes, but the main theme is uh, I'm less a fan of slow Dio and more of a fan of up-tempo, either fast OTT Dio or fast mid-tempo Dio. I want to hear melodies. You know, I, I want to hear, I, I want to hear last in line, Holy Diver and Dream Evil Dio. That's my favorite Dio, right? Yeah. Um, so definitely Doug Aldrich on Killing the Dragon had that mandate as well. He was very explicit when I talked to him about that. Like he wanted a, a, a more up-tempo Dio. And I, I, I do love that album. I play that a lot. And I'd say that's my favorite from the 90s all the way forward. And that's why I would name the second <laughs> book that, uh, you know, the production super clean and, and, uh, and just kind of, uh, not super blocky on the snare drum or the bass drum. It's not overly bassy. It's certainly not an overly doomy album. It's just, it really sounds like uh, th th those early days, even a little hair metally here and there with push and things like that. And, uh, uh, but the title track's amazing, just a great riff. So that one, that one is, is definitely the gleaming machine of the two thousands. Um, Magic I would put last because it's uh, this is almost like one of those, be careful what you wish for things. You know, everybody wanted a, 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 uh, a concept album out of Ronnie one day. And so he does it and everybody's like, ah, this is too complicated. It's maybe a little cheesy. It's like, what's going on. It needs a whole essay to explain plus the lyrics. Uh, and at the same time, it's kind of a little dour and slow and doomy, um, you know, mellow bits. And uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't really like it all that much i just i just wanted some some songs with hooks to emerge out of it and there really isn't that much on that and then master of the moon is kind of like musically and even production wise it's a little close to magica but at least it's not a concept album um so i can find more to appreciate so i'm going to put that one uh in the middle of all these uh mm -hmm. but again just three uh because you know essentially what happened is uh is um heaven and hell took over the band heaven and hell took over and with that he gave us a a full full-length album a live album uh how does it work so we got the full-length album which is really long i believe and then three songs that came even before that were added on to the yeah you know the the thing so so you have you have That's one and a half yeah. albums from those guys plus plus the live thing and then they reissued the early days live album they did a lot of touring um so that that kind of took over and then we never got another Dio album because he yeah. dies dies of stomach cancer so yeah you were mentioning in in the in the book about uh that um uh, Dio was threatening uh to make Magica uh, a trilogy <laughs> right uh, so, yeah. so do you think he dropped it uh because the sales weren't good and he got some pushback or he just ran out of time do you think he would have uh, continued with the trilogy if he had the time I have a feeling he would have continued with it, but he did run out of time and heaven and hell was a pretty, you know, it was a pretty high profile, you know, the album didn't do that great, um, but it was fairly well received again. It was slow, right? I mean, this yeah. is Sabbath and Dio were the same uh, when, once you got up into this, this realm of things when Ronnie was in the band, that, that album was slow and doomy and dehumanizer was slow and doomy. First two weren't, weren't like that really. Um, mm -hmm. But um I think he just ran out of time. He probably would have done it. He he always seemed to be pretty upbeat about the story. I don't think he particularly um, would have uh, noticed or got uh, because people loved Ronnie. I loved Ronnie. He was great. Um, I don't think he got a lot of negativity about it uh, at the time. Um, but um, yeah, I, I could have seen him him carry on with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he really was steadfastly in love with that slower deal. And he used to say that it's um, it's easier to uh, it's more fun and more creative and easier to sing and do vocals and lyrics over, over slow, slow. Music than fast music. And I think that's why he liked it so much being a vocalist oh. and, a, and a lyricist. Um, so he loved that kind of music. And uh, and like I say, I, I would I would prefer it to be a little more up tempo.
Right on. Uh, so um, when you reflect back on the whole discography, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? What, what do you think of the Dio discography? As a whole. I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, like I say, I think they're all very professionally done. Um, I think there's a lot of great songs on Sacred Heart as well. So I'm, I'm fine with that as well. Uh, like I say, in the later period, I really like Killing the Dragon a lot. But uh, one of the neat things about Ronnie is, uh, and I've said this about Graham Bonnet too, but Ronnie's the, the clear case of this. Um, both of them though, um, but this is me being contrarian because some of my Graham Bonnet views are are you know not not uh, particularly uh, you know mainstream but let's just say both of them i think um are t- are two of the only guys who are on three of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time uh with three different bands and with ronnie that would be rising holy diver um because it probably more or less is considered the greatest one yeah. and heaven and hell three different bands and with Graham, it would be No Parole for Rock and Roll, uh, Michael Schenker Assault Attack, and Rainbow Down to Earth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, all three of Graham's are, are, are of a level lower than, than the, the three Ronnies, at least out there in, in, the, in the public realm. But I, I put them, them all pretty close. So I, I think that's pretty cool that those two guys have been on three of the greatest with three different bands. Right on. Yeah, you don't see that very often, that's for sure. Yeah. So um, before we go, why don't you pri- provide us with an update on uh, what you're currently working on and what's uh, going to be uh, some upcoming releases uh, coming from you, because you seem to always have some uh, books coming out. Yeah. Uh, so I've got the History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff audio podcast that I do by myself. That's just me talking. I'm up to 148 episodes of that. We've got the Contrarians YouTube channel uh, with Marco and Nick. Um, they do a great job of editing and putting together and planning everything so we've got regular episodes and dark horse panel episodes with our fine patreon subscribers um and then myself i've got a really swanky beautiful looking david bowie book that's uh, out in a couple of weeks um and uh i've the damned book is in production um that's basically me reviewing every damned song uh i've got the visual biography series through weimer i've got stock at martinpopoff.com of the blue oyster cult van halen thin lizzie nazareth hawkwind uh the yes and now we've got yes part two uh coming out in a couple of weeks so that's yeah. coming soon and the Alice Cooper big visual book, um, which was soft cover, that's now going to be turned into a trade paperback and cracked into two books. So we're going to have one on the original band and then and then one where Alice goes solo. So I think that's pretty much everything that's uh, that's coming up soon. And where can they reach you to get the books? Uh, martinpopoff.com uh, there's full descriptions there's paypal buttons for canada u.s international i sign them all send them out, uh, out from my office um that's my main my main source of income is being a mail order guy of my own books yeah i hear you so um the um what was i going to say i've i've lost track <laughs> okay. well uh anything else you want to chat before we head i don't think so i think we covered everything that's pretty cool um, right. But yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on here. And uh, yeah, just uh, ha- ha- I-, I think people should go back and reacquaint themselves with all these different deal eras. Well, I'm definitely going to be uh, checking out the Killing the Dragon because, you know, uh, the, the classic era early albums I like. So uh, that yep. seemed to be the one that I'm going to be uh, going back to revisit yep. for sure. Yeah. So thank you for joining us and everybody who's watching, listening. Uh, thank you. And remember to check in at our website, www.themightydecibel.com. Have a great one.